Good afternoon. I call to order the April 24th, 2023 Dr. Cog TAC meeting at 1.30. Thanks for being on time, everybody. Um, my name is Sarah Grant, and I'm representing the city and county of Broomfield. I am the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. In this in-person live stream format, members of the public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. Those attending online, please make sure that you've typed your name and it reflects your first and last name and your representation. We ask that those intending to speak use the raise hand button to ask a question or comment on an agenda item. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to the staff in the Q&A box. Again, please use your raise hand feature to ask any questions. Reminder, during the business agenda item, only TAC members and alternates can speak or ask questions. Members of the public may speak during public comments. And Cam is sending around the sign-in sheet. So those of you that are here in person, please make sure that you do sign in before the end of the meeting or come find Cam to make sure you sign in. And now we will begin the roll call. We'll start on the end here. Jefferson County, Christina Lane. Mike Whitaker, difficult alternate. Ash, Weld County, Frederick. Tim Mormon, Adams County, Thornton. Jeff Denkenbring, Arapahoe County, Centennial. Lisa Wynn, Denver International Airport, Aviation Special Interest. Deborah Basket, City of Westminster, and Jefferson County. The Greenwald, City of Longmont, and Boulder. Chris Quinn, RTD alternate. Cam Kennedy, Dr. Cox staff. Sarah Grant, City and County of Broomfield. Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog staff. Ron Papsdorf, Dr. Cog. Rachel Hull, Team Bicycle, Colorado Non Motorized Alternate. Down for Bartlett, City and County of Denver. Jim Houston, CDOT Region 4. Chris Agahan, CDOT Division of Transportation Development. Uh, Justin Schmitz, Douglas County, City Lone Tree. Matt Callison, Arapahoe County, City of Tom Reif, Douglas County, Tom Casserock. Alex Federate, Boulder County. Boboda, City of Northland. Person Priest, TDM, non motorized. Josh Schwank, Dr. Cog Staff. Jessica Mickelbust, Colorado Department of Transportation, Region 1. The Gasper City and County of Denver. Rick Pilgrim, Environmental Interest. Hillary Simmons, A Little Help, Senior Special Interest Seat. Thank you, everybody. And now I will like to turn it over to Jacob and Rong for some announcements. Well, I have some sad news to announce today. Today is Deborah Baskett's last TAC meeting with Dr. I hear that Deborah is retiring. Um, if I'd known that she was originally a psychology major at SUNY Buffalo, I might have been more careful about some of the things I've said to her over the years. Um, I don't even know where to begin with Deborah and recognizing her service to this region. Um, yeah, one, uh, you're way too young to be retiring, um, but if I accomplished half of the things that you have in your career, I'd be super pleased with myself. And so you should be proud of your contributions to this region. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'll rattle through some things. My understanding, City County of Denver, uh, RTD, the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce, uh, City of Boulder, Commuting Solutions, Broomfield for 17 years, uh, and now Westminster. You've served on the RAC Board of Directors. TAC since 2005? Yeah, 20 years on TAC. Um, and, um, and special leadership serving on the International Board of WTS. Um, so just amazing, Deborah. Um, can't begin to thank you for your service to this region um, and to Colorado. Um, so you will be much missed and, and appreciate everything you've done. Thanks, Ron, and thanks for taking the time to dig up that stuff on me. I forgot I was a psychology major <laughs> so long ago. I wish the best of luck to all of you. Um, it is really important to show up for these meetings. You're all 
that, it gives you a rare glimpse into what other jurisdictions are doing and attitudes and policy-making desires, um, and I think it keeps us whole and truly a big believer in the most important together. Um, I was just going to mention one thing that will date me, but some of you will remember. Before we had this TIP process, had TIP meetings that were incredibly divisive and competitive and on the whiteboards, like added, trying to, we didn't have Excel spreadsheets that you went, bink, okay, here's how it balances out. So I think back to those days, and I'm glad of the projects that did get done that were good regional projects, and um, we didn't make project perfect. Thank you for the acknowledgement. I appreciate it. Thank you, Deborah. We will certainly miss you around this table and in the Denver Metro region. Thank you for all of your contributions to transportation. Uh, we will now move on to public comment. And um, again, this public comment is uh, limited to three minutes. Um, as a reminder, after the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will be able to partake in the discussion regarding each agenda item. If you've joined by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button. And we'll call on you to begin speaking. If you've joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine, and we'll call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you, and you need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone, and you will have three minutes to speak. And at this time, we will take public comment. Do we have anyone in person um, or online? Please raise your virtual hand. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't see any hands raised uh, at this time. Yeah. Okay, we will move on to our business agenda. Um, so you'll see in your meeting packet, meeting summary from the March 2023 TAC meeting summary. If there's any discussion, corrections, or questions, uh, now is the time to bring that up. Do we have any discussion or corrections? Seeing none, the minutes will stand as approved and we will move on to our first action item. This will be the fiscal year 2024 to 2027 Transportation Improvement Program Subregional Share Call for Forum Recommendations. I'll hand it over to Todd. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, congratulations to everyone who's gone through an almost year and a half TIP process. It felt like four years. Um, and many of you, I'm sure, could feel like more than that. Um, but we are nearing the end of our $455 million allocation um, from 2022 all the way out to 27, two tips, four calls for projects. Um, as you can see, with the, with the first two calls, um, these were for the current tip that we have um, now before us, um, both a regional and a sub-regional call. Uh, we conclu concluded this process that, um, last fall where we were able to program those funds into the existing TIP. Um, most of you, if not all, have already started your IGAs and actually have started to obligate your funds on these projects, so congratulations on that aspect. I'm sure um, over the coming months we will hear much more um, you know, of, of success stories to get these projects out the door. Uh, then we moved right into calls three and four to construct a brand new TIP um, with call four subject of this afternoon um, in your action and $193 million uh, essentially to allocate. So a little bit more detail about this call for projects um, took place from late November to late January. Um, this was for both air quality and multimodal and the STBG or surface transportation block grant tracks um, versus calls one and two was just the air quality and multimodal. So each one of your, your forums was provided two targets within each one of these tracks. And so you went through a process to submit your applications um, directly to your forum. Um, you went through a scoring, deliberation, and ultimately a recommendation process. Um, as part of um, TIP calls three and four, you also were in the process of de developing wait lists. Um, one thing I would point out, um, 
I think from at least the staff perspective and hopefully from everyone else's, um, all, all four of these calls, but especially when we get to call, um, call number four, sort of a, a snapshot in time because in a, in a normal process where we have just two calls for projects, you're really looking at sort of what was the action within the first call and that sort of drives what action that you would have within your last call or call two. Um, this time you were looking over four calls. So it's a little difficult to really take a look at um, the projects that were submitted and ultimately recommended in this fourth call to get a picture of sort of what is happening within the region. So you really need to look at all four calls. And we'll go into a, just a tiny bit more detail a little bit later on in this process. Um, but this, the table up here summarizes the projects that were submitted and ultimately the recommendation. Um, not planning on going through each forum's recommendation, but just wanted to provide a summary to you at this time. Again, a total of 84 projects for $308 million that were submitted. Ultimately, 62 projects being recommended for the $193 million target. Um, in terms of the waiting list, again, if you're trying to do some math quickly on the screen, that is not going to add up because uh, certainly possible that only um, some projects were partially funded and therefore would have ended up on both the wait list and the recommended funding list. As we started earlier in this process, we're continuing our public comment process, um, a little bit new than what, we, uh, than what we've done in the past. But the call for comment period um, was open from February 1st all the way to the 22nd. Um, the public and anyone else was able to comment directly on a web map that Dr. Cog's staff provided. Um, they could also do this through any other traditional means, email, phone. Um, this was conducted via an e-blast to get the word out, um, in addition to putting postings on our website and any social media. Um, within that web map to be able to comment, um, they were able to indicate support, concern, or oppose any project. Um, in addition to adding any written comments they may choose. Those comments were provided to each one of the forums. Um, in total, almost 1,100 comments were provided to us. Um, all of that information was provided back to the forums so they, they could use that within their deliberation and ultimately their recommendations. So before we get to the proposed motion, just wanted to outline what these next steps are. Um, so we will follow up the call for a recommendation at the May RTC in the board in the, in the, uh, in the next few weeks. Approximately mid-July to mid-June to mid-July um, will be the public comment for the new 24 to 27 tip. This will conclude at the July 19th Dr. Cog board meeting with a public hearing. At that time, we will also provide a little bit more information about a high-level summary of what was um, ultimately recommended within calls three and four and ended up uh, within that draft tip. Um, then we will come back to this body in July, followed with the RTC and board in August, looking for the recommendation and action on that new 24 to 27 tip. Um, one item I did want to point out that was a correction within the agenda packet, um, and this is for the Broomfield wait list. Um, it does reference the Southwest Weld Forum waitlist, which is incorrect. Um, so that should be adjusted to Broomfield. Otherwise, I hope this is correct. Uh, please let us know if something is not correct so that we can bring that up. Um, otherwise, the promote, proposed motion before you is to move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the sub-regional share projects to be included in the draft 24 to 27 tip. Thank you, Mr. Cottrell. Do we have any uh, questions? Any comments? Um, does we have a proposed motion if there are questions or comments? Let's see. You can second the motion. Second. 
<laughs> All right. I will move to recommend to the RTC the subregional share projects to be included in the draft fiscal year 24-27 TIP. Second. Thank you, Ms. Basket. Thank you, Mr. Greenwald. Further questions or discussions or comments? Ron? Before we vote on the topic, I just want to express our thanks to all of you and the local agency and our partner agency staffs. This has been a very long and challenging and new process for a variety of reasons. New money, the bill, the greenhouse gas standards at the state level, lots of things led to a more complex and complicated TIP process. Um, but um, throughout this process, everyone really continued to work together. Um, I really just want to express a lot of thanks to Todd and Josh for leading the effort on the Dr. Cog end. It was an enormous amount of work for them as well as you, and just appreciate all of you. Um, the, the upside of all of this cumulative effort culminating with this fourth step, and once we adopt the 24 to 27 tip, is over $400 million being allocated to really significant and important transportation improvement projects around this region. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pat Forrest, and I agree with all that. Thank you to Dr. Cog's staff and four TIP cycles. <laughs> um, that was a big heavy lift and everybody around this table involved in all of your sub-regional forums to, have to put together this project list to move, move our region forward. So thank you. A motion in a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. One opposed? Any abstentions? It passes unanimously. Thank you. We will move on to um, our informational items. So next on the agenda, item number five. Uh, the Dr. Cog Environmental Justice and Equity Project, attachment C in your project. And I will turn it over to Mr. Badal Sanchez, our Regional Transportation and Planning Program Manager, to introduce this item. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so as introduced, discussing our Environmental Justice and Equity Project. There we go. Um, so a quick outline of what we'll be discussing today. A reminder of our different equity requirements that Dr. Cog is subject to how we've captured those before in our various plans and programs, a reminder of our project that we've been working on since last summer, um, going over the deliverables that we have at this point and how we're looking to use them moving forward. So just on your screen right now are three examples of the plans that we have where we do have an equity analysis, environmental justice analysis, moving from left to right, our Title VI implementation plan. That's really the plan that houses our foundational equity and environmental justice analysis what are the areas we're looking at? What are the investments we're looking at? Um, what populations, indicators, characteristics do we include in our analysis? <coughs> the Regional Transportation Plan has a number of different ways that we're capturing equity and environmental justice. And then the TIP takes that one step forward with the subset of projects that are included in the TIP. Uh, for each of these, there is a mapping component. So across the different plans, we do highlight what are the different geographic areas that we call environmental justice zones, and then overlay the various projects that we have in the plans across them just to do a visual check how is investment landing across the different counties the different regions that we have in the denver area we've been working on this cross-divisional project since last summer um, the objectives that came out of this project are to create a more meaningful equity analysis for the agency we want to evolve our stakeholder and public engagement uh, use this analysis in future project funding and investment decisions for the rtp and the tip and then use this index in some of our other plans, programs, activities that we do as an agency. So getting beyond just our transportation planning requirements. Like I mentioned, we've been involved in this since last summer. There have been four distinct phases. We have wrapped up phase three. We're in the starting in the middle of phase four. Um, phase one was a research document, just seeing how can we improve the data that we're using? What are the different characteristics, indicators, variables we should have in our equity index, in our equity analyses? Um, Phase two was recalibrating what we call our environmental justice zones and then making that final data set with the new characteristics that we want included in our equity index data set. Phase three was the longest uh, that ran from fall of last year to this spring, um, creating the agency's first equity index for the region and an accompanying benefits burns analysis. I'll touch on both of those pieces as deliverables in this presentation. And right now we are using what we have found to draft 
the environmental justice report for our transportation improvement program, so something you'll be seeing as we go out for public comment period. And then moving beyond these phases, phase four, we are looking at how we can test this and build equity more explicitly into our regional transportation plan and get the word out, not just to our external partners, but also our internal staff of how can they use this equity index and the findings that we've developed through this project. I'll do a quick reminder. Um, the equity index data set uh, replaces what we did have, which was our vulnerable populations data set. That included seven different characteristics, indicators um, of what we call marginalization in the region. The replacement we are calling our equity index data set. That does include some definition changes to different communities, as well as some new variables to meet some of our state requirements. And then we also ended up looking at a couple of our peer MPOs across the nation to see what they were including in their own tools, their own methodologies. And so a few of those are also um, an addition based on that. And then the last piece is the revised environmental justice zones data set that I mentioned. So those discrete areas in the region that have people with low income and people of color above a particular percentage. Um, both of these are available on our regional data catalog for use by um, external partners and our local member government members. Getting into the actual development of our first equity index, um, there were three phases that we were looking at to develop that. We did do a comparison of what already exists nationally, what exists at the state. That includes looking at Colorado's own Enviro screen as well as some of the other tools that are available that the federal government's using for some different grants that are out there. We also did a comparison of some of our peer MPOs. Those include Philadelphia, Corpus Christi, the Bay Area, and Pinellas, Florida. Um, part of that was also having one-on-one -on -one interviews with each of them and asking them some standard questions to see how did they develop their index, what indicators were they using, what was their methodology involved, how did they engage their external partners, um, some community members in that process, and then our GIS staff also piloted a number of different options um, to develop, build, and ultimately um, show an equity index for the region. What came out of that is um, on your screen, our equity index uses what we call or is called domains. So each of those different variables that you saw, those 10 characteristics indicators, are grouped into these three buckets or domains, economic status, mobility barriers, race, and national origin. And with this grouping, we're able to take a score for each of those and then come up with an overall score for each of the different areas in the region. Um, we chose this because it's going to be easy to grow this index in the future. Maybe there are variables that we want to add in the future. There are different areas like health that we might be interested in growing that index to. So having this organizing structure will help with the future revising and growth of that equity index. It's a little easier to explain just three different areas. What is the economic status score of a particular tract than saying, well, how does this particular indicator compare to people of color versus low income versus older adults? So being able to group similar indicators together, a little more easier to explain. Uh, and then the last piece is that it, over, it avoids overemphasizing a particular um, domain over each other. So uh, people of color isn't washed out by households without a vehicle. Um, you're taking a score that reflects that particular characteristic and comparing it um, equally to the other two domains that are part of the equity index. Getting into benefits and burdens, I'll define that um, in one of the next slides, but we looked at three different distinct ways to develop this benefits burdens piece. Um, the first was just figuring out what's already out there. What could be our organizing principles for this benefits burdens analysis? So Metro Vision already has those five themes. Our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan includes our six priorities. And then USDOT has their Justice 40, which notes five impacts. So we wanted to look at each of these um, and make one that was a hybrid that worked for our context, our region, what we were trying to achieve. We also had community-based organization outreach. So we held two listening sessions, virtually and in person. Um, we invited over 80 community-based organizations from across the region to help us define what's the benefit, what's the burden, um, what are the potential impacts that occur when a project gets um, located, funded, built, implemented in their area. And we also wanted to um, reach out to our staff who are also experts in this area. So uh, we had a Mentimeter staff exercise with staff uh, and asked them what are the potential impacts, the potential benefits, potential burdens um, based on these four uh, high-level project types. One thing we did when we were uh, talking with our community-based organizations and we want to do here as well is just make sure we all understand what a benefit burden is. We've been using that pretty shorthand in our project. 
Um, I think we are all aware that a transportation project, depending on where it is, depending on how it's designed, um, depending on where it comes from, depending on the context, can provide both benefits and burdens to the surrounding community. There are both positive and negative impacts potentially for the project, depending on how it's implemented in the region. And as part of this equity analysis, we do want to strive to take that into account moving forward. And so, um, like I mentioned, benefits, positive burdens, negative impacts of those projects. So what, what could potentially occur with a project? From our two listening sessions, uh, on your screen now are just a select list of the findings that we heard from those community-based organizations. Uh, in the memo is a more comprehensive list of what we heard. We just pulled these seven that we thought were the most important from those findings. Uh, some of these, as you're reading through these, you'll note aren't the purview of Dr. Cog. Um, we cannot implement free or reduced fares across the public transportation system. Um, some of these are both perception and then physical, so there's a desire for better safety. Um, how can we as a regional agency um, fit into that role? So some of these we recognize aren't our role, um, but we did want to uh, show these findings um, to y'all and make sure that we were being transparent with what we had heard from our community-based organization partners and how we can build what is within our purview in our equity analyses. I mentioned the Dr. Cog staff outreach. So it was a Mentimeter exercise, Mentimeter survey. You've all done those here as well. Um, we ended up grouping all the different projects that exist in the transportation improvement program into these four high-level buckets. So transit projects, active transportation projects, roadway projects, and safety operational projects. For each of these categories, staff were asked um, to score, to evaluate um, what are the most important benefits to achieve, what are the most important burdens to avoid, what are the likelihood that particular project types will provide benefits um, to surrounding communities, to people of color, um, to low-income folk, to older adults. And so it was a pretty extensive Mentimeter survey that staff ended up responding to for each of these four project areas. On your screen right now is just a high-level summary of just color-coded of what those responses were. Um, I show this just to note that we are all aware of, staff is very aware that all projects have benefits, all projects could potentially have burdens. And so you're seeing that on this screen, just looking down a column, roadway, transit, active transportation, or safety operational, there exists the potential for benefits and the potential for burdens across each of these project types. Um, and so there are some that are maybe popping out more. So if you're looking at transit, active transportation, um, the potential risk of displacement it appears pretty high on this graphic. Uh, when you're looking at the potential burdens that exist, uh, increasing access to essential opportunities and service, roadway projects, transit projects, active transportation projects have a high likelihood of providing that benefit to the surrounding community. So making note of, a, in a holistic way, all the benefits and potential burdens that could exist with a project as it's implemented. Part of the project is the, this proposed list of benefits burdens uh, based on our research into those organizing principles that we already have or are out there. Um, the structure comes from USDOT's Justice 40 initiative, so that pairing of a benefit with a particular burden. Um, all the text in bold across this screen are actually the changes that we made based on what we heard in our community feedback, as well as what we heard in terms of staff expertise on each of these. And some of these categories are also areas that we as an agency could grow into as other programs, activities, services at Dr. Cog uh, use our equity index beyond just our transportation planning functions. So the high-level benefits, burdens, findings uh, based on community-based organization feedback and our staff Mentimeter um, are these, these statements that we're making about those high-level four project types. Um, roadway projects likely to provide proportional benefits, proportional burdens to nearby communities. Transit, active transportation, safety operational projects likely to provide more benefits than burdens to nearby communities. As part of this, though, underneath each of these, we do note the potential notable burden or notable benefit that could occur. So like I mentioned on that previous slide, transit, active transportation, a notable potential burden is that risk of displacement. So um, we do also want to highlight what are those those, those notable, potentially important benefits or burdens that could be achieved or should be avoided with each of these four project types. Um, there are a lot of caveats, limitations with this. Uh, we, like I mentioned, do want to test this with the RTP. Uh, 
we recognize that that will need to be revised. The TIP as a subset of projects from the Regional Transportation Plan is already looking at a smaller geographic area. Um, as the RTP uh, includes projects from across the 10 county area, using this um, scoring for like geographic distribution of projects might not mean the same thing when you're looking at a subset of those projects in the TIP. We would like to continue to build on our community engagement that was done to provide more robust, more comprehensive results related to benefits and burdens since we only had those two listening sessions as part of this phase. Um, when you're looking at the TIP, there are projects that are funded with support from multiple agencies. Sometimes our portion of that investment is actually pretty small. So what is our role in evaluating that? Um, and then there are projects that are already included in the, in the TIP that are from other agencies' processes. So the analysis that we're looking at for the TIP is just on those projects that have Dr. Cog funding attached to them. Um, also related to the TIP, projects can only be for one phase of a project development. Maybe it's only a study right now. So um, we have taken the approach um, historically and continuing on that just what is the ultimate implementation form of that project. So we do recognize that you might only be asking for design right now in the TIP, but what could that ultimate vision for that project be? And then a general caveat for all of the different analyses that are done at this level, especially at the regional scale level, is that they're inherently limited. Um, we recognize that the different communities, the different contexts, different design elements, the mitigation measures that do occur with the project are up to our individual project sponsors. Um, we are looking at this at a regional level, so not going into the project details, project specifics. I'm leaving that within the, the NEPA category for our project sponsors. But um, with this analysis, with these findings, we are wanting this to be another piece of information moving forward that uh, different review panels, staff can take into account as they're considering what are the investments that could be made in the region. So next steps, uh, we do want to test this equity index and the benefits burdens findings with the recommended TIP project. So including it in our environmental justice report for the upcoming transportation improvement program. Uh, we want to evaluate and revise that as necessary. We actually have an update next year to our non-discrimination plans. Uh, one of those is our Title VI implementation plan, and that is where our agency's foundational equity analysis lives, just the floor of what we're doing as an agency. So we're committed to seeing how it works with the TIP and then updating it, revising it as necessary, and including it in that non-discrimination plan update. Um, phase five, which was that regional transportation plan test, is still relatively amorphous, so we want to further uh, explore how we can incorporate equity more explicitly into the regional transportation planning process. Um, how would that look differently compared to the TIP equity work? And then um, one uh, final next step that we're hoping to uh, uh, move forward with is piloting some accommodation strategies to enhance and improve equitable engagement, specifically doing it through our corridor planning program and community-based transportation planning program. That concludes my presentation, Chair. I'll take any questions? Mr. Badal Sanchez, any questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Heidright. Question on page eight of the presentation, the index, the economic mobility and then race and national origin scores, are those all weighted one third to provide the final index? Um, I believe so, yes. Yeah. So. Um, that's the, the goal of the domains is no individual indicator is washed out or um, overemphasized in that, so they would be third. Um, and that allows us to, if we had a fourth domain at some point, be able to grow that um, and keep some fidelity to the, the organizing principle. And within each of the three is the, the three, five, and two metrics each weighted equally? Uh, Ms. Holteen. Thank you. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, uh, the, the plan for um, testing this with the TIP, the result of that would help us better understand how the projects that have been awarded through this TIP project process will be scoring using um, the, the index that you've created, right? So it kind of helps us understand we've made these decisions now we're going to better understand like the EJE uh, implications of those decisions. Is that kind of a good high level summary? Yes, um, we've always included an environmental justice report in the tip. This is just growing with that, uh, that original piece that we have had. So 
Um, I think one of the uh, initial analyses was just like counting how many um, EJ zones are touched by a project. So I'm um, getting beyond just the counting, um, what are the potential benefits, potential burdens that exist with the projects that have been recommended. So no impact to the decisions that are being made currently on the TIP, but another piece of information that we have post-selection process and that we can build in to future TIP and RTP um, investment decisions. That was kind of the second part of my question. So then running the, the looking at how to incorporate that in the RTP and like future things. So we would be, would be evaluating what you learned through the TIP testing, and then that would be coming forward with how that informs prioritization and scoring of projects moving forward and how we can better utilize that index earlier in the process. Am I high level getting, yes, getting how that? How we can use um, the index earlier in the process, not just once the projects have been recommended for funding decisions. Um, I lost a thought. I apologize. If it comes back, I will mention it. Great. Thank you. Oh, and I think your thought is that, and recognizing that the process is for the TIP and the RTP will be different. Yes, um, and that jogged the thought. Um, part of throughout this process, uh, especially related to the community-based organization feedback, has just been um, how can we improve the TIP and RTP processes, the application questions in general moving forward. Um, obviously, those would go before y'all, the board, for that uh, policy approval. But how could questions be retooled to more specifically speak to some of the findings we heard from our community-based organization partners? What are some questions that we don't currently have that could have, that we could have in applications moving forward? Mr. Hydright? This layer is something that could be added to the TIP Data Hub? Uh, yes, so staff are currently evaluating um, how to grow that TIP data hub into a general data hub. So the inclusion of the equity index data set will be a part of that. Um, and then just the, the, the raw data for both this and the environmental justice zones are also just available on the regional data catalog. Um, within the equity index data set is the score just overall, as well as those domain scores. So if you're interested in what is the economic status um, compared, to, compared to other census tracts, um, you could also see that just within that raw data. I don't think there are any more questions or comments. Uh, thank you for that presentation, Mr. Badal Sanchez. Really appreciate the work that Dr. Cox staff is to stay on top of the most up to date information, how to look at environmental justice and equity in our communities, and how we may be able to use this in the TIP process in the future. And in particular, making sure that we have this data available to us through the data type catalog. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the next item will is another informational briefing from Mr. Badal Sanchez, and this will be introducing the RTD Partnership Program Attachment D in your packet. Thank you, Chair, and I will uh, right away just pass it off to Charlie Stanfield with the Regional Transportation District to give this presentation. Thank you for being with us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Charlie Stanfield. I work in the planning department at RTD, and um, we've been working on a pretty exciting new program over the last few months uh, called the Partnership Program. And so the purpose of the Partnership Program is to leverage RTD funding as well as local funding to provide additional services to meet a community's local mobility needs. I'll note that the Partnership Program, the intent of these funds is not for infrastructure investment. Um, the requirements of infrastructure investment and infrastructure projects are, are very different than uh, what this program is working on, and so that, that would be a different process. We do partner with folks on infrastructure investments, so please reach out if you ever do have um, transit-focused infrastructure projects and, and engage RTD staff on that. Um, but the partnership program, it's going to create a dedicated budget set aside uh, for partnership matching uh, and create a position within RTD to manage the program. Um, it's going to also establish a process to evaluate uh, partnerships after implementation, something that has not been there in the past. And we're going to leverage the sub-regional service councils. These are groups that were established last year uh, to focus on local mobility, local uh, community transportation needs, um, and providing feedback to RTD on its services. So I'll touch on a few dates here uh, for the first year of the program. We hope to release a call for projects in June. 
um, as well as hosting a Q&A session uh, in June after the release of that call for projects. Uh, this is going to outline uh, the available funding, the requirements, as well as the application and what we'd be expecting to see in the application. Um, that call is going to be open for about 30 days, uh, and we plan to announce awardees in September. Um, there'll be IGA development um, and working on agreements uh, through the end of the year, and we hope to launch projects in the first half of 2024. So the 2023 call for projects, as I mentioned, uh, we expect to release that call in June. Uh, local governments and TMAs, TMOs, are eligible uh, to apply. No more than 30% of 2023 funding is going to go to any uh, one subregion. Um, and the subregional service councils are going to prioritize projects if there's more than one project submitted to RTD uh, from a subregional service council. Um, there's $2 million available for 2023. That amount is going to vary year to year based off of our board action. There is support from our board for this program, um, and I think the intent is that we will be able to ramp up funding slowly over the course of the next few years. Uh, it's a lot to get these projects off the ground um, from a staffing standpoint, and so we're kind of starting off with some seed money to get us going and, and hope to ramp up from there. Um, RTD will fund 80% of project costs uh, for up to three years initially, an initial funding commitment of three years. Um, and then all, we, there's a lot of existing partnerships that we have out there right now, and those are going to be slowly rolled in to the program starting in 2024. And I'll note that due to our labor constraints, uh, successful applicants uh, will need to select a third-party operator for this round of funding. Uh, we just do not have the, the bus operators to provide additional service out there ourselves. The project selection criteria, um, alignment with RTD's strategic plan, local support and ability to meet the local transportation needs as defined by the subregional service councils, uh, providing service where there's a gap in existing RTD service or complementing our existing services, providing service to equity zones, um, the potential ridership that a project might generate, and then project readiness. Has uh, the project sponsor done planning? Uh, do they understand what it's going to take to get a project off the ground? Do they have experience uh, in the past of, of operating similar projects? And so the project selection process, it's, it's a two-step process uh, that we're going to go through this year. Uh, first, applications are going to be stored, scored by RTD staff based off of a rubric that's going to be included in the call for projects. And then um, after that, there's going to be a selection committee created. And that selection committee is going to be made up of both RTD staff as well as one representative uh, from each subregional service council. Um, that selection committee is going to develop a final funding recommendation um, that we're going to move forward with. And in, in, in July, I know a lot of you have already gotten this presentation at the subregional service councils, but uh, in July, uh, the subregional service councils will select their representative. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there will be uh, ongoing evaluations uh, to guide continuation. Um, this will uh, determine future funding after that initial funding commitment. Uh, projects are going to be expected to meet performance metrics uh, as defined by RTD service standards. Um, so for 2020 really 2024 launch, um, going to have to fall into the community category of our service standards, which is 10 boardings per hour for uh, a fixed route service or two boardings per hour for a um, demand response service. These may change in the future. Our service standards do uh, adapt and fluctuate a little bit as ridership in the region um, fluctuates and adapts. Our, our, we all know ridership out there right now is not what it was pre-pandemic, so as ridership slowly rebounds, I expect our service standards will, will reflect the um, increase in ridership that we'll hopefully see over the coming years. Um, but we're not going to move the goalposts on you during that initial funding commitment. Um, whatever we're committed to, those, those performance metrics are what you'll be expected to be meeting um, over the, the first few years of your project. And finally, next steps. Uh, if you're thinking about applying, uh, start planning now because that June is coming very quickly. And, and start coordinating with your subregional service council members on priorities for uh, your, your area. Um, we've launched a web, a web page. Uh, there are a lot of FAQs on there. Um, I encourage you to go read through those um, and reach out uh, to me if you have any questions as well. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we're going to have that Q&A session in June um, for anyone that has questions after we've released the call for projects when you have time to review. Um, that's all I have. I'm happy to take any questions people might have. Thank you, Mr. Stanfield. Any questions or comments? Mr. Papstorf? 
everyone is surprisingly shy about this. <laughs> Surprised. Uh, thanks, Charlie. Really appreciate it. I, I, I guess I, I, I do. Can you go back to the performance metric slide again? I, do, I, I guess I want to understand that maybe, and for the local government members to understand this a little bit more. Um, I understand an, eva an annual evaluation, but marrying this up with the call for projects that will begin in June is the idea that RTD is funding some service for a three-year period. Yes, so we, we will initially commit up to three years of funding with the project launch in 2024. You know, that would be 2024, 2025, and 2026 funding. Um, and then, yeah, your performance metrics would be the same. You'd be evaluated each year, but, you know, we're not going to pull funding that we committed for 2025 and 2024 because your project's not performing. Uh, new, new services, they do take time, you know, to, to get ridership and get a follow -up. Thank you for that clarification. That's what I was looking for. Mr. Greenwald. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a quick question. So if we have services that are in our already, this dollar amount is above and beyond what you're already providing. Correct. So if we try to save RTD money, is there a way to recoup some of that saving from RTD as well? Um, maybe. I think it would depend on the specific uh, situation. Uh, We're talking <laughs> hypotheticals, right? Um, I, I would say if you have an idea, approach us as staff. We're trying to be really flexible with this program um, and, you know, be open to ideas. There's a lot of good ideas out there, and we want to be open to those and be flexible. Saying there's a chance. Yes, there is a chance. <laughs> Mr. Pilgrim? Madam Chair, uh, Charlie, the $2 million for the first part of the program, how does that that work with Ron's question about the multi-year funding. Is it two million spread over three years or two million a year? So it, it'd be two yeah. million per year. That's our, our board has a midterm financial plan that they adopt every year, and that's what's included in that plan. It's two million per year going forward. Um, the hope is that we'll be able to get additional funding for the next call uh, above and beyond this existing two million. So um, I hope that provides some clarity. does but um, just trying to let's say somebody has a you know the 30 percent is under the 30 percent so it's 500,000 a year which would soak up a million and a half but it's not a million and a half of the two million it would be a million and a half of the six hundred the six million yeah it would be 500,000 of the two million a hundred of the two million yeah, it'd be it's an annual and and you know some people may not be asking for three years of funding. Yeah. Um, and so it, we're, we're looking at it on an annual basis, basically. Okay, great program. Mr. Schmitz. Yeah, Charlie, just first of all, very excited to see this program. I know you guys have been working on it uh, quite some time. It's really exciting, I think, uh, to see that partnership come in. One note you had mentioned was there's a 30% cap for one um, region, if you will, or, or sub, is that, uh, so obviously that'll have a little bit of limitation, I guess, on that funding, might. Um, and is that something that is going to be re-looked at as it moves forward? Is how it works, or I guess just kind of curious where that came from? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, everything we're looking at it as we move forward, how it works. Uh, this is a new program, and it's a partnership program, so we're going to be asking for feedback throughout the process from you all uh, to guide, you know, future years and how things work. We've already been tinkering with with details of the program based off feedback we received from everyone in November. Um, so, yeah, that, that will be um, kind of looked at in the future, but it's kind of a guideline, I guess, right now to try to make sure that, that funding is being evenly spread throughout the district. Um, so, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I just had one follow-up. I think we've already asked this before, but, um, you know, this is for both new or expansion of existing services, right? Um, sort of either of those could potentially qualify as programs. When you say expansion, what do yep. you mean? Uh, I would say a service that already is in place, expanding into new areas or new service that doesn't exist today. Yeah, I think that could be on the table. It just, it w RTD would not be able to directly expand the service, if that makes sense, yep. uh, this year. That makes sense. Ms. Basket? Um, so, Charlie, has, have you all thought about what comes after the three years? So, if the new service meets the performance standard, would RTD then take over 
operation of the service or an expectation that it's a forever partnership? I think uh, nothing is forever. Uh, I don't want to predict the future in three years. So uh, I, I don't think we've really ironed out what things look like after the fact. Um, as, as funding allows and as performance, uh, if a project's performing and there is funding for uh, the project to continue, um, I think that there would be support to continue the partnership. Um, you're, you're getting out of my wheelhouse a little bit more into the service development uh, side of RTD, so I don't want to speak for them as far as taking on services. Thank you, Mr. Stanfield. I have a couple of comments that I wanted to pass along. I mentioned these in our service council meeting uh, last week, but I think it'll be really important for RTD to, um, in their call for projects, develop a local agency checklist of all the expectations for developing an IGA. So that's very transparent to the local agencies, what's going to be involved if they are awarded the funds. So I think that'll be really important. And if you have a template IGA ready to go so that local agencies can start thinking about what all those requirements will be, I think will be really important and beneficial for the workflow of the entire process. The timeline um, is very ambitious. And a few things that I would recommend to kind of keep everybody on track, um, beginning partnership service at first quarter 2024 is to have all that information included. And um, once awarded, if local agencies can start working on that RFP and having that reviewed by RTD um, in concurrence with the IGA development would be very beneficial. My experience is that RTD does not allow the RFP process to begin. Um, including any kind of review until after the IGA is executed. So I think um, those items would really help expedite the process for local agencies. Thanks for those comments. And, and the, your, you know, the checklist and the template, it's, they're, they're great comments and something that um, you know, we've struggled with a bit because with this program, we're, we're trying to provide the flexibility to allow for any ideas to come forward at, while also you know, trying to provide you uniformity and certainty. And so we, we've stood up this program to try to, uh, you know, do this in batches so that there's multiple people going through the process at once and we're not, you know, pulling these partnerships randomly and they're randomly in different uh, timelines, I guess. And so the hope is that we will be able to streamline that a lot more and be able to do them in batches. And I am working on some high level template that we can get, but it, it does get difficult due to the varying natures of projects that we expect to receive. Thank you. I appreciate the work that's being done on that end to um, provide as much information as possible on the front end to local agencies. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions, comments, discussion? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Stanfield. Thank you. And we will move on to uh, item number seven, which is the RTD Northwest Rail Peak Service Study. Uh, Mr. Rieger will introduce this. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so a second presentation from RTD. I think most of you are aware that RTD has started to work on uh, Northwest Rail Peak Service Study, and I know some of you were actually intimately involved um, on the technical committee or the study committee. So we wanted to do a little bit of a deeper dive on this study so that you all can understand uh, what RTD has done so far and where they think they're going next. Um, again, the Northwest Rail Peak Service Study, and the project manager is Patrick Stanley, who will give the presentation. Patrick, thanks for being here. Uh, well, thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Patrick Stanley. Um, I am the uh, project manager of the Northwest Rail Peak Service uh, Feasibility Study. Um, I also like to introduce uh, Rick Pilgrim, who uh, is the project manager for our consulting team, HDR. I uh, just want to recognize he is here uh, today as well. Thank you. Um, I want to start off real quick uh, with really a refresher of the Northwest Rail. Um, in 2004, the Northwest Rail was approved as part of the Fast Tracks program. Um, the Northwest Rail in total is 42 miles. Uh, the first six miles, um, which is known as the B line, is an electrified overhead, uh, overhead electrified segment that runs on RTD dedicated and controlled tracks. 
the remaining 35 miles of the corridor um, run on uh, BNSF existing freight tracks. Um, the service would run from Denver Union Station all the way up to Longmont. Um, in the peak service, we were evaluating, um, you know, what could be a first step here uh, towards the realization of a rail solution in the Northwest area. So, as I mentioned, 2004, Fast Tracks passed. Uh, in 2010, we did the environmental evaluation. Uh, the environmental evaluation looked at uh, full double tracking of the entire corridor, 11 new stations, and around 55 trips per day. Uh, due to a lack of a dedicated funding source um, at the time uh, of that uh, environmental evaluation, it wasn't able to be implemented at that time. In um, 2013, RTD uh, conducted the Northwest Area Mobility Study, or NAMS. Um, in NAMS, it really looked at the Northwest Rail from a phased segment perspective. Um, it was determined uh, with, with the uh, project, the Northwest Area stakeholders and RTD at the time that the Northwest Rail would be, uh, really is considered more of a long-term uh, long project. So in 2016, as I mentioned, the B-Line opened. Um, and uh, like I said, uh, that's the electrified segment. Uh, we'll get to why that's important here in a, in a little bit. Um, and then in 2017, the peak service concept really came from the Northwest area stakeholders. And kind of since that time, we've been working with our stakeholders to, to really refine what that means, peak service. And we've also started to re-engage with the uh, Berlin or the BNSF railway. Um, so the peak service study, like I said, it's really a feasibility study. Um, so we're assessing what a peak service would look like on the Northwest rail, which consists of 3 a.m. Um, weekday trips from Longmont to uh, Denver, and then 3 p.m. Uh, weekday trips from Denver back to Longmont. Uh, we want to partner with our uh, local jurisdictions to plan six new stations. Uh, those would be in Westminster, Broomfield, Louisville, Boulder, and Longmont. Uh, we're looking to identify uh, feasible locations for a maintenance facility in Longmont. Um, and this is where the vehicle kind of comes into play. Right now we have overhead electrified um, rail that's not really a, a feasible option right now for the, uh, uh, on the BNSF railway, just because clearance issues mostly with existing structures. So we are looking for a little bit different technology uh, to, to run this particular uh, line. Uh, coordinating with the BNSF railway, um, of course, obviously it's their railroad, so they're kind of an important cog to this, this whole uh, discussion. Um, we're also evaluating uh, potential train types. And when I say that it's not really part of the the goal, it's not really one of the goals of the study to identify the specific vehicle that we're going to get, but we are looking to identify what options are available and really confirming that there is something that works for, for what we need from an operational standpoint. Um, then of course, we're exploring um, any uh, potential partnerships and, and obviously the big one I hear that probably many people have heard about is the front range passenger rail. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, six new stations uh, so right now, the B line currently terminates at the exist, at the Westminster station, which exists at 72nd and Lowell. Um, for, so moving south from up uh, to the north, uh, the next station would be downtown Westminster, which is near 88th, Broomfield 116th, Flatiron, downtown Louisville, Boulder Junction at Depot Square, and then downtown Longmont. Uh, so while RCD is leading. Uh, leading the study, we certainly can't do this alone. Uh, so um, it's a collaborative effort uh, between RTD local transportation partners, uh, the BNSF Railroad, uh, CDOT, and the Front Range Passenger Rail District, uh, among others. Um, everybody you see here on the slide make up our study advisory team, which provide guidance and input to our study. Um, a lot of familiar faces here from from that team. So um, unfortunately, we're we're losing one as well. So that about that. Um, but, you know, together, hopefully, you know, we, we want to try to figure out how to, how to develop a safe, reliable, and well-connected mobility uh, multimodal transportation network in the, in the Northwest area. So why is peak service uh, maybe a, a beneficial way to look at this? Uh, so given the fact that we have limited resources, um, you know, we, there's limited infrastructure and less operations to a peak service concept. So a little bit less to have to uh, lay out in the beginning as far as costs go. Uh, it's a cost-effective approach um, that we can begin train service while we uh, continue to pursue funding for an all-day 
uh, operation. Uh, it would accomplish uh, many track upgrades and safety features such as positive train control, which I'm sure many of you have heard about in the, in the news, but uh, PTC systems. Um, there, this is, uh, we're not the only ones that have done this. There are other jurisdictions that have uh, used the peak service, uh, peak service model to bring a uh, initial starter service to their area. So um, there are plenty of precedents for that. And then of course, uh, you know, it's the way for that we can address some of the ridership for today. Um, didn't turn that off when I was putting it in, but okay. Everybody hear me okay? All right. Um, so there is no plan start date for, uh, for the Northwest Rail. This is a feasibility study at this point. Uh, what we want to identify is, you know, what type of improvements and in infra infrastructure do we need to put in place in order to operate a peak service? Um, you know, really what we're, we're doing is we're trying to identify what we refer to as a common set of facts. That's, you know, what are the operational costs? What are the construction costs? Uh, what are the uh, rider? What is the ridership? The benefits? The impacts? And uh, what potential strategic partnerships might be available uh, in order to move with the north, move forward with the Northwest Rail? So this is just a, a brief uh, slide on the schedule. So milestones. It's a five milestone process uh, with our consultant right now. Milestone. Well, milestone one and two are really fact finding um, efforts. We wanted to, you know, it's been a long time since we did the EE in 2010, uh, so a lot of things have changed, and we needed to go out and identify what's different now, what development has happened, what are the plans for the jurisdictions, and, uh, you know, what, what do we need to plan for today? Um, right now, we're in kind of towards the tail end of Milestone 3, uh, which is really defining what the initial footprint is, what the stations look like, what the infrastructure is that we need to build out, uh, what some of the numbers are. And then uh, we'll move into moving into milestones four and five. That's when we'll start looking at potential partnerships. What are some options to take a look at, and what are the uh, strategies and next steps? So I wanted to touch a little bit on the uh, uh, community outreach and input. So we had uh, two open houses. Uh, one was in Boulder on January 31st, and the second one was in Westminster on uh, February 2nd of this year. And we had about, I'd say total between the two, well, we had 195 attendants uh, in person of those two uh, particular events. Uh, we had a total of 29 comments card at the events themselves, but, you know, we provided a lot of, lot of uh, direction to, for people to get to the online meeting that we also had, which ran from January 31st until February 21st. Uh, in the self-guided online meeting, uh, we had approximately 3,300 total views. Uh, about 173 people filled out a survey, and uh, you know, we had a little over 100, 350 people that visited the RTD website, uh, filled out comment, uh, comment forms, and signed up for um, email uh, distributions. So right shortly after we had our uh, first our open houses, we kind of sat down with our SAT team, um, the consultant, and RTD, and we just kind of did a debrief. You know, what, what did we hear? And in general, what we heard is there's kind of a reverse, I guess I would call it a reserved excitement um, about the project and, and us kind of continuing the discussion. Uh, we heard, you know, there's certainly some concern with the service itself, you know, just being peak hours, uh, that it may not necessarily work for everybody, but we still got a lot of good feedback that even though it doesn't work for me now, I'm, I appreciate the fact that it's moving forward and it could be something that could expand to be something that I could use later on. Uh, we heard a fair amount about reverse commute concerns, um, you know, people that might need to go from Denver up towards Longmont in the morning. Uh, we also had comments about additional stations, station and gum barrel, uh, or gum barrel and Niawat were kind of the main two that we heard quite a bit about. Um, a lot of conversations about potential partnerships, front range passenger rail, uh, BNSF railway, what would those partnerships look like? Uh, Cost and ridership differentials between peak service and full build. Uh, you know, what is, what is peak service really, really uh, what is the difference between the two? Uh, we heard a lot of uh, comments about uh, customers with non-traditional commute times as well, maybe somebody in the service industry or hospitality that doesn't necessarily commute, um, you know, on an eight, nine to five type, uh, type job. 
growth around the stations was a concern. Uh, and when we talked about what we heard in the meeting, it was really more about, you know, what does it look like? Is it private? Is it public? You know, what, what just getting a sense of what, what the development around the stations might look like. And then, of course, one of the big questions that we all anticipate coming is, you know, what are, what are the next steps if Northwest Rail uh, peak service study turns out to be uh, infeasible? So then we, we had a chance to take a look at the community comments themselves. And what I would say is, for the most part, there was a lot of similarity from what our takeaways were from the meeting. Uh, we did have quite a few, you know, just statements, kind of overall support or neutral about the study in general and us uh, uh, taking it back on again and continuing the conversation. Had a number of people that talked about, again, this may not work for me now, but it, it could work in the future if it expands, as well as, uh, you know, it was interesting. We actually had quite a number of people that talked about coming from somewhere else, uh, maybe the East Coast or something that had a robust transit system, and they were excited to hear uh, what was going on here. Um, Again, the station areas, like we talked about, that was also a common theme on the comments, uh, you know, particularly up on the diagonal, the Niwot and Gun Barrel. And then other topics uh, that we heard quite a bit about were service related. So how does this integrate with the existing RTD service uh, systems in the area? Um, you know, what, what, um, what might that mean? Are there any reductions that might happen to the other current services? Uh, as, re as it relates to Northwest Rail. Uh, questions about land use. And again, this one is kind of the same sort of thing. What does the nature of that land use look like? What does it look like around the stations? And we also heard from, uh, on some of the comments, concerns about people being pushed out of the area, um, you, you know, due to this, uh, due this, this uh, rail service and development that would happen around the station. And of course, we heard quite a bit about construction. It's a little early to talk about that one, but uh, obviously if we moved into that phase, that would be something that we would address need to address at that at that time. So one of the survey questions I want to touch on here is uh, this is a uh, survey question we ask about asking people to kind of identify what would maybe keep them from using a Northwest Rail service. Um, and I'm not going to necessarily go into every one of these, but the bulk of the the uh, the major ones were really related around service uh, service di um, directions, service. Um, locations, that sort of thing. So you can see need weekend service, uh, need midday service, uh, need evening service. So it's really kind of more about what the actual peak service is. Uh, kind of down towards the bottom, you see uh, proposed route does not stop near a key destination. So that was, that was on the lower end. And of course, uh, one of them is what do you see as the benefits of peak service? And I was a little bit um, pleased to see that this one was pretty high numbers across the board, which to me indicates that People can get a, lot, a wide range of benefits out of the service. It's not really just one thing. Um, so, you know, it goes anywhere from, you know, avoid being stuck in traffic uh, for reading. There's one that reading, reading books and resting on the train. Um, I have fallen on a, asleep on the train myself before, so I get that. Um, and then kind of down towards the bottom, really kind of reduce transportation costs. And this one uh, really ties into the uh, maintenance facility. Um, so we'd like to just note that most of the people I think that left a comment on this one actually don't live near uh, any of the proposed maintenance facility sites. But nonetheless, the type of comments that we heard are ones that we would we would expect. Uh, the two major ones being noise in, noise impacts and air quality and emissions. Uh, with a few people uh, obviously worried about a number of private properties that might be impacted and visual impacts. So the next steps uh, on the on the project, we're, we're uh, are going to continue defining the initial footprint um, of all the stations, the the uh, BNSF uh, sidings that we would need to do on the corridor. Uh, Want to use the public input that we that we received to refine and inform uh, what our base configuration is. Uh, we continue and uh, to define the uh, common set of facts. This is something that's really going to continue throughout the entirety of the of the study. Uh, we did do an update to the board on in the uh, April 11th uh, Finance and Planning Committee, and then uh, we'll look. We're looking to have uh, our next set of public open houses in late uh, late spring, early summer. I'd say probably early summer, really at this point. Um, but that's that's kind of the look ahead of what's happening next on the project. And with that, that concludes the presentation. And I'll be happy to answer any questions anybody has. Thank you, Mr. Stanley. Any questions or comments?
Really? No questions on Northwest Rail? Really? It's okay. You don't need to, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ms. Holtine, thanks for the presentation. Um, how, what is the, how long would it take to write it from one end to the other? What's the, the length of that, that commute? The uh, travel time modeling that we've done shows it would be a little over an hour from Longmont into the U.S. and vice versa. Yep. And then uh, not knowing a lot of the details before this presentation, um, is there a reason why at least one reverse train commute wouldn't be made available if that's one of the, the concerns? The primary reason uh, that it's a concern, is it really has to do with the infrastructure. Uh, right now, the track coming out of Westminster uh, that we would tie back onto the, uh, the rail or the freight track up to Longmont is a single track. So we are talking to West, uh, the BNSF who, who needs you know, three or four sidings or so along the corridor for them to really pull out of the way for us during a uh, kind of a, uh, during the peak period. So basically those sidings would be utilized by the freight uh, trains, but otherwise we don't really have a good siding track that we can actually do a passing movement on. Um, and, you know, part of the goal of the peak service is to really do a pretty um, streamlined service to try to get it down to a number that, that we hope can move the needle. Great. And I just want to express my enthusiasm for the benefits that people listed. It was really exciting to see that. So thank you. I, I see any more hands raised. Appreciate that update, Mr. Stanley. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Um, and we will move on to the administrative items section of the agenda. Item number seven will be uh, member comments and other man, uh, matters. Do we have an update from the AMP working group, Carson? I do, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, AMP Working Group met uh, earlier this month on April the 4th. We heard an informational briefing from CDOT's Office of Intimate Mobility Team regarding their ongoing and upcoming grant opportunities. The group also heard from Dr. Cog's staff regarding the Dr. Cog Innovative Mobility Set-Aside Program and discussed some opportunities there. Uh, our next meeting will be next month at the Denver International Airport and looking forward to that and I'll have a report from that uh, at the next meeting. Thank you. Carson, um, do we have any other updates from any other members? Or Jacob or Ron? Go ahead, just, Mr. Papster. Just a reminder that we sent out information on the um, 2023 uh, notice of funding opportunity from USDOT for the safe streets and roads for all. I know a number of you were um, recipients of grant awards from 2022 to do um, uh, uh, safety plans for your community. So that's definitely a focus for the administration. So if some of you didn't apply for that opportunity last cycle and are, and are considering pursuing that, I know that Emily Kleinfelter um, on our staff would be happy to work with anyone to help support those efforts. We have asked, like we have in the past, for other funding um, opportunities to please just give us some basic information if you are considering applying for a grant. We'll share that out at, I believe, the June tech meeting just for information. Everyone just helps all of us be aware of um, uh, who might be pursuing grant applications and identify opportunities to maybe partner for activities um, on those grant programs. Thank you, Ron. Um, any additional updates from members? Okay. Um, just a quick reminder, if you didn't sign in, um, please do make sure you find that sign-in sheet um, or check in with Cam to make sure that uh, you are accounted for being here today. And our next TAC meeting will be May 22nd, 2023. Deborah, we will miss you. And we are now adjourned at 2.45.